if everybody could please stand and uh, it'll be 10,000 reasons. Good morning, family. How is everyone today? All right. I'd like to welcome you and ask you, if you'd like, read along with me as we do our call to worship today. It will be in the book of Isaiah, for, uh, chapter 35, verses 4 to 6. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. 
for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. This is the word of God. Amen. Christ is our forever. 
Praise God, everyone. Well, as we're standing, why don't we uh, turn to one another and just greet each other, say what's up. <laughs> Let's find our seats again. It's always good to have to call people to go back to your seats. But I do want to call up, we have some, some out of town guests. We have our missionaries here, you guys can come on up. This is Bill and Ann Clemmer. And they're coming all the way from the Congo, right? Okay. So Thank would you, you just, just share with us, uh, you know, where you're from, what you do, and how we can pray for you. Great. Thank you. So it's really nice. Whoa, this is a nice mic. Could I take this back to Africa? <laughs> because nobody listens to me when I'm there. No. So it's really nice to be back with you this morning. My name is Bill. This is Anne. And we first came here in the 1990s. We had just come from Haiti. And we'll be, uh, we were in Cap Haitian, uh, working at a mission hospital. And we're being transferred to Africa. Uh, and we just completed our 31st year. And yeah. And... <laughs> All of our kids were raised on the continent, and now they're here in the United States, and they're just upset that mom and dad signed up for another five years because God's calling does not stop. So just really quickly, um, it, this is kind of a homecoming because I grew up in this part of the country. I actually grew up on uh, Cape Cod. I uh, grew up in a really strong Roman Catholic church and uh, went to a Jesuit college, and somewhere along the way, I learned that it is by grace we are saved through faith and not what I was working towards doing. And during that process, God, I was a math major. My, my sense was that God wanted me to teach mathematics at high school on the Cape. But it's really funny how God changes things around. Uh, God challenged me to practice my faith, to become a physician, and leave the Cape, leave Massachusetts, and I've been practicing. Though I still have my license in this country. I've, I've never used it. I will be dangerous. I just got my new license. And uh, we've been working in Africa for all of our career. Um, and I guess what I will share later this morning is God has been so good. We have lived through volcanoes, earthquakes, coup d'etats. When I was last year in 2015, I had just been released. I was held behind rebel lines in the Congo for 11 months. We were separated, almost lost my ears, but I kept them. Um, and just, I know the one in whom I trust. And I know that he is able to keep what I have entrusted to him until he comes back. And so we want to share this afternoon or later just how good God has been. But the best part about serving as a missionary in Africa is my dear wife, who I met in Africa, but that's another story. Good morning. Um, so everywhere we've ever been, I've followed Bill. He, he's the missionary doctor, and we went to Haiti, and uh, I went with our four kids, homeschooled our kids. And we've been in, uh, we went to Zaire, uh, and that became the Congo. We served in South Sudan for four years, and now we're back in Congo again. And um, for the first time, I'm 70. I'll be 71, actually, this year. Oh, um, I'm right behind you. But, uh, <laughs> but for the first time since we came to Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I feel like I've really, God's given me a ministry of my own. And I, I just love kids. Um, I was a high school teacher back in the US um, many, many years ago. And uh, I, I work with 50 passionate young people who teach the 800 kids who come to our Sunday school every Sunday morning. And um, God keeps opening doors to new ministries. Our newest one, which will be one year old in November, is a ministry to street children. And we've had a lot of those kids um, uh, are in baptism classes, and we've had um, 
45 have been reintegrated into homes in Goma. So, and when we come back later, we have a little short minute, uh, 10 minute video that you can actually see um, the area where we work and we'll tell more about what God's doing there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Grant, would you come up and we'll, we would love to just pray for you guys and just praise God for your faithfulness and ministry over those 31 years. Um, so Grant, would you just start us off? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for Bill and Ann and their faithfulness to you and to all of the different ways in which you've called and led them to serve you and serve your people all over the world. Um, God, thank you for continuing to renew and stir in them hearts for your gospel and ministry and seeing, seeing this through and remaining faithful, remaining obedient to what you have and not their own timing, but your timing. And God, I pray for just continued faithfulness for Lord, we praise you for the fruit of the ministry that they've seen. Praise you, Lord, for being with them in the challenging times like that separation. And I'm sure many others, Lord, that have been incredibly trying. Lord, thank you for their faithfulness to you. Thank you, Lord, that you are a faithful, gracious and glorious God that remains faithful and steadfast. So, Lord, we pray for them this morning that this trip will be an encouragement, that today will be a blessing, that will be a mutual encouragement to us as a church and to them as well. God, that your name will be praised and honored in our midst, that greater delight will be found in your name, that your name will be made more greatly known, and it will be less about us, and that Christ's name will increase. It's in your name we pray. You. We praise you for the faithfulness of Bill and Ann in their ministry. We pray for the next five years that you would just give them more blessing, more fruit from their, their efforts of sharing this beautiful gospel of grace. We pray that you would draw those kids in Goma to you, that you would use their efforts and work uh, to promote gospel uh, clarity uh, for, for many people to hear and see and believe in you, Jesus. We thank you for their faithfulness and pray that you would continue to sustain them and keep them and grow them closer to you, Christ Jesus. We look forward to hearing more um, after the service about their ministry and just pray, pray that you would just bless us this morning. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Give, let's give it up for them again. Thank you. All right. Well, once again, good morning, everyone. Welcome again to Winthrop Street Baptist Church. That's really hard to follow. Um, my name is Grant. I'm one of the pastors here. If we haven't met, would love to meet you after service. I left my Bible at my chair, so I'm pulling this up. Technology's good when it works. Um, well, hey, real quick, a couple announcements, and then we can continue our service forward. Really two big ones. Most pressing one is next Sunday, October 8th. It was posted last week, but just as a reminder, we do have a members meeting following the service. So check out the agenda for that. It'll be an exciting Sunday, uh, a lot to praise God for. So we'll look at that, talk more about that as we approach next Sunday. And then also, uh, now that summer has passed, much to my sadness, uh, but to greater joy is our Sunday school classes are coming back. So this was something we really rolled out at the start of the new year with in line with our theme of being stronger together as a church and kind of years coming out of COVID, like, yeah, that's a art that we've lost, a discipline that we had lost and are gaining back is Sunday school class. So after service, we have a uh, five week class, short and sweet. So you don't want to miss out on it, on the holiness of God after service. So really diving into one of the core attributes of who God is and God is holy. What a great thing to spend five weeks on. We could spend five lifetimes on. So Sunday, October 15th, immediately following service right in here uh, as we've done. With that said, <clears throat> excuse me, we're continuing in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. We are reading verses 46 to 52 this morning. Mark 10. 46 to 52. Let's read God's word together. 
<clears throat> and they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And we had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we praise you. We thank you that by faith we might see, that by faith our blind, lost eyes might see clearly who you are, all you've done, and all that you are continuing to do. Christ, thank you that you rescue, redeem, and save all of us who are blind. Lord, that in your gospel, there's hope. Because apart from you, Lord, we are just the blind leading the blind. And we need you, Jesus, to open our eyes and let us see and see clearly that the only hope in this world is in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus alone, crucified and raised because he is alive. Lord, we do pause this morning and... Uh, Think of Gail Delgado, or many of us uh, know and love Gail. Uh, heard this morning she, she was rushed to the hospital with um, potentially a heart attack. So we, we just pray for Gail. We, we don't know details, but we pause and take this moment to pray for her. We thank you for her and her um, just many years of faithfulness to you. And Lord, we just pray for peace and comfort and healing and wisdom for doctors and whoever's seeing her right now at the hospital. So pray they be with her, and we praise you that we know that you are with her, Lord. God, we pray for many in our church family and congregation who are struggling with illness. God, pray uh, this time of year comes around, changing the seasons. People get sick often and frequently. Pray your hedge of protection around all of us that we might just best worship and honor you. And Lord, pray for, uh, I think of Vincent today and just Thank you for him and pray that we just continue to remember him and pray for him and for encouragement for him and the many trials he's faced over the past year. Uh, God, we, we think of so many more, Lord, that are struggling, fighting grief, fighting sadness, fighting loss, fighting humbling, challenging situations. Lord, I pray that all of those things will point all of us going through them back to you. And Lord, those of us that are rejoicing and feeling victorious and high and mighty, may we be grounded and leveled and humble to know it's about you and not about us. So Lord, it's all about you. It's not about us. May the name of Christ increase here in our midst. And we pray, Lord, that your word will go out boldly, without shame, without fear, not only here, but all over the world this morning. We praise you, Lord. It's in your name we pray, Christ Jesus. Amen. Everybody, please stand and we continue praising through the words of our gospel song. <laughs>
And kids can be dismissed to the children's church. You guys can make your way back there. Um, and I, I do want to make just one announcement. I know sometimes there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things going on in the church, which is a good thing, but it kind of makes the announcements like you're a traffic cop in some ways. But one announcement is um, the Friday morning women's study is going to be starting this Friday. Is that at 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock, Friday morning, women's study. Huh? 1030. 10.30 is what I'm being told. I just totally knew that. 10.30. Friday morning. It's going to start up here this morning. If, or, yeah. Oh, uh, Kate, good enough. Well, not, no, not Grant. Not Grant. We have really derailed in this whole situation. <laughs> What's the Robert's Rules of Order? What's that about? Where are we? All right. So before I was at Winthrop Street, I did nine years working with teenagers doing youth ministry. And, you know, working with teenagers, you never have any idea where the conversations are really going to go. You know, if you have kids or have teenagers, you really, truly never know what you're going to end up talking about. And there was this one youth leader that we had. Um, he would always just kind of not, not stir the pot, but get things going. You know what I mean? And he'd always have a would you rather question. You know these types of questions? So, you know, there's the boring ones like would you rather Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks? Or would you rather Coke or Pepsi? You know, I say neither, neither to both because I'm a weirdo, but whatever. But sometimes he would like, he would take the, the questions and raise the stakes to different levels of weirdness. So he would ask, like, would you rather fight against one lion-sized duck or ten squirrel-sized goose? You know, really important questions that you have to think about. So for our passage today, I have a would you rather question. Would you rather be blind or poor? Both options are significant challenges in life. You know, being blind is incredibly difficult. You know, for some of you that have had eye surgery in the past, you know what it's like to at least be blind for a period of time. You don't know where anything is. You have to be led around. You don't know where to go. And you have to, you have to essentially rely on everybody else. You don't have the basic sense that everyone else has. To be poor means that you don't have enough money for food or shelter. You have to rely on the generosity of others. I mean, both positions are really tough to be in. And in Mark 10, 46 to 52, it shows a man who is in both of those situations. He's both blind and poor. His name is Bartimaeus. Thankfully for him, Jesus has come to town. Jesus is going to pay attention to him and his hurting condition, this poor, blind beggar. Jesus is going to show his disciples and us what it means to be a slave of all and a servant of all and to serve those who can't do a thing for you in return. Jesus loves this man enough to stop and help. And this is now the last section, the last part of this section in Mark 8 through 10. And this whole section we've seen deals with humility and servanthood and sacrifice. But now from here, from chapter 11 on, it moves directly, quickly to the cross. But before his entry into Jerusalem to endure the cross, Jesus had to go through Jericho, which is the setting of this passage, which is 18 miles away from Jerusalem. This is actually the last of the healing miracles recorded by Mark. And ironically, Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, sees Jesus far more clearly than any of his disciples, even though they have two good eyes. Mark 10 is full of Christ's teaching on discipleship, but none of the disciples show the faith, the insight, or the discipleship of Bartimaeus. He was in a desperate situation, and out of his desperate situation, Bartimaeus had a desperate faith that saves. So let's first look at the desperate situation that Bartimaeus is in. 
Mark 10, 40, 10 46 begins just as Mark 8, 11 to 8, 22 did, except for different town names. Instead of Bethsaida, they're in Jericho. Jericho was a beautiful city that had recently been restored by the Herodians, who were the kings in Israel. Jericho was their winter palace. Jericho was the last major city on the edge of the Judean wilderness. This town was over, 400, or over 800 feet below sea level, and they're soon going to make a 3,500-foot climb to Jerusalem, 18 miles away, where Jesus will give up his life as a ransom. But before he does that, he has to stop and help someone who's hurting and who's in desperate need of love and care. Mark describes the situation for us in verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, a son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. So just picture the scene here. There's a mob following Jesus and his disciples on their journey to Jerusalem. They've made a pit stop. They're all on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. It was actually customary in that day for distinguished rabbis to travel with an entourage like this and to teach them as they walked. The difference is that for Jesus on this journey, it's just how big the crowd got. It got so big, it got so massive, to the point that going through Jericho was difficult. And so they're going through Jericho because it's closer to Jerusalem, and it was difficult because there's so many people on their way getting prepared to worship for the Passover. And everyone in the crowd, they, they'd heard of Jesus, they wanted to see him. And Mark pauses to describe Bartimaeus. And for him, it was like any old day for, for blind Bartimaeus. He woke up, shook the straw off of his ragged and torn clothes, he got on his feet, Maybe he had a stick or pole that he would use to tap his way to get to the city gate. And along the way, he might have been able to beg for a small piece of bread or some, some sort of food sustenance. And he took his spot along with all the other beggars at the gate. He took his cloak since it was his prized possession, and he sat there. Like many days before, he listened to the coming and going and happenings of the city life. He hears the animal noises. He hears the, the chatter of the men, women, and children coming through the main gate. Maybe he can smell the aroma of the meat and the fish going to the market. I mean, Jericho is humming along, and here's this blind beggar crying out. He was also poor. Begging was the only way he was able to gain sustenance in life. So look at this man. Look at how desperate he is. This is a desperate situation. And it's easy for us to not stop here and just to continue on in the story, but we have to stop because Bartimaeus is a mirror to us, isn't he? He's a mirror to our spiritual lives. By nature, we are blind and poor spiritually. We're in fact so blind that we think that our vision is perfect. And that's what sinners are. Sinners are so blind to their sin that they think their sin is right and the only way to live. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 says, you can turn there if you want, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, because we're going to go to this passage a couple times. 2 Corinthians is after 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. It says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So sinners are so blinded that they cannot see the glory of the gospel in the light of Jesus Christ. Sinners are so blind that they can't even see the fact that they're blind. And spiritually speaking, that's what we are. We are blind 
and in a lost spiritual state, unable to even see that we're lost. We can't comprehend the blackness of our sin, the terrors of the wrath of God that's due to come because of our sin. That's our state. The unrenewed mind is so blind it can't even see the attractive beauty of Christ. And as sinners, we don't recognize the glory of Jesus and we will remain blind until God opens our eyes. And only God can graciously show sinners the blindness of their hearts. Only God could do this. I mean, this is what happened to us. Once we were regenerated, we're made new by the Holy Spirit of God, and we're able to see that our sight has been compromised, and we're able to truly realize that we were blind. But we weren't just blind. We're also spiritually poor. We're impoverished spiritually. Think of the first man, Adam. When Adam sinned, what did he lose? He lost his perfect inheritance, paradise. And that was the first home of humanity, and now it's this dilap dilapidated mess, this jalopy. And we're left to beg, and we have nothing to fill our hungry souls and nothing to cover our naked bodies. You know, think of Jacob and Esau. You know, so many people think of, think of Jacob being a trickster and all this, but what was Esau thinking? Esau gave up his inheritance for a bowl of soup or porridge, whatever it may be. And isn't that what we do when we sin? When we sin, we give up everything we have in order for the present day moment, for the reality, just like Esau. And so the question is, what can we bring to the God of the universe whose majesty is far beyond our wildest imaginations and our comprehension? What can we bring to him as spiritually impoverished as we are? What can we offer him? This God who holds the universe by the word of his power, who has created all beings what can we offer him? I mean, he has the universe, he has the stars in the sky, he has galaxies at his beck and call, he has angels glorifying his name. What can we bring to the God of the universe who owns everything? You see, spiritually, we are utterly impoverished. So blindness and poverty, you might think, oh, it doesn't really apply to us, but it does because it's the spiritual state of all mankind until Jesus comes to visit us in his love. So here's Bartimaeus sitting by the roadside, and he senses this great crowd coming this way. And, you know, first comes the young children running through the gate, then more people are hurrying past, talking with great excitement. He could maybe even overhear the crowd saying that Jesus of Nazareth was here in Jericho. Bartimaeus, you see, he had heard of Jesus because word had spread everywhere about his exploits and how Jesus had healed the lame and lepers and even made the blind to see. And Bartimaeus, you know, he had a lot of time to think about Jesus and he made up his mind that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah and he's now coming to Jericho. So think of Bartimaeus, his heart must have started to pound and as the crowd is passing by, what if he misses Jesus? What if he misses his moment? Jesus might be gone soon. He had to do something. And so here's what Mark tells us, verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus was making himself heard, crying out at the top of his lungs, and wouldn't you do the same? I mean, he's desperate to get the attention of Jesus, so he yelled at the top of his lungs. Have you ever been in a situation where you had to do this? Maybe like at a, at a concert or a sporting event or some other thing going on where there's a lot of people and you're trying to get one person's attention and so you yell for that person, maybe a friend or loved one or whatever and 
slowly but surely the people around you are starting to look at you like you're crazy, right? Isn't that what happens? It's kind of this like weird groupthink dynamic. And that was Bartimaeus. The people around him were trying to shush him, saying, hey, just, you're making a scene. Stop. You know, we don't want Jesus thinking that all of us from Jericho are like you. You know, just shut up, you beggar. Jesus doesn't have time for you. And this is this, is this mob mentality, this kind of herd behavior took over, and that's a tragic reality, isn't it? I mean, we see in our news, like, we see these stories of how, like, crowds end up trampling and stampeding over people, and it's like, how does that happen? Like, I've just never been in a situation where that would happen. But it's that the crowd adopts the feelings of other people in the crowd to the detriment of other people. And this is what was happening to Bartimaeus. Even before Jesus arrived, the people despised Bartimaeus, which is ironic because his name literally means son of honor. But now he's receiving anything but honor from those that are actually attracted to Jesus. So he's marginalized. He's put on the sideline, told to shut up. Bartimaeus was no longer noticed. They don't see him or hear him. And day after day, he's begging to survive. Maybe some people give him scraps and just move along. But once he hears that Jesus is passing by, he starts to shout loudly with this great messianic respect. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd says, shut up, you loser. The crowd was so hateful to Bartimaeus. They dishonored him. They didn't care about him. But Jesus did. Bartimaeus knew who Jesus was, and he wouldn't be shut up. This was the chance to have his life changed. And so he cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the people said, shut up. Son of David, have mercy on me. Just picture someone else saying, hey, can someone shut him up? So he says, Son of David, have mercy on me. Buddy. If you don't stop, you'll need to have some mercy. So he says, son of David, have mercy on me. And Bartimaeus was out of their control. He begs Jesus, have mercy on me. But notice, he didn't blame Jesus for his lack of sight. Right? Isn't that what we would do? We'd be like, Jesus, I can't see. This is your fault because you're God. He doesn't do that. He didn't say, Jesus, why did you let this happen to me? But he's aware of his condition and knew that Jesus was the only one who could do something about it. Bartimaeus knew he was blind. He had constantly lived in darkness. He knew that he was physically blind and he was aware of reality. But he knew that he was also spiritually blind too. He was unlike so many people today who are living in spiritual darkness but have no idea and are totally unaware of their grave problem. Chuck Colson was a political advisor to President Nixon, and he was involved in the Watergate scandal. After he spent some time in prison, a friend had the courage to boldly tell uh, Chuck Colson that it was his pride that was keeping him from believing in Jesus. And so after he left a friend's house who just delivered this devastating report, of his condition before God, Chuck Colson described his experience in that moment while he was sitting in the car. He said, that night when I sat alone at my car, my own sin, not just dirty politics, but the hatred and evil so deep within me was thrust before my eyes forcefully and painfully for the first time. I felt unclean, and worst of all, I could not escape. In those moments of clarity, I found myself driven irresistibly into the arms of the living God. So have you ever felt this way before? Have you felt like that? Like, do you know the painful reality of sin's presence in your heart that's so deep within you that you'd never be able to escape it? See, the cry of Bartimaeus applies to us as well. Have mercy on me, a sinner. That cry comes from a place of profound clarity, of self-understanding, 
and it brought about the grace of God. Jesus rejoices to meet such a clear self-understanding as this. Bartimaeus showed clarity and insight into the person of Christ, and so he repeated, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And that title, son of David, was a messianic title that looks to God's promise to David going back from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, which says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is what that title is coming from, that Jesus is the son of David, the fulfillment of this scripture, of this passage. You know, prophecy in the Old Testament works two ways. It's kind of like a mountain range. So if you stand on one mountain and you look out, you're going to see the closest mountain next to you. But you're also going to see the mountain that is further off in the distance and higher and taller and bigger. And in the same way, that's what this prophecy is talking about. Because Solomon was the immediate fulfillment of this specific promise and prophecy in 2 Samuel 7. But we also know that it's a partial fulfillment and that the full, true, ultimate fulfillment is coming in Christ. The final climactic fulfillment of this prophecy. And Bartimaeus saw this. The irony. The blind man saw this and calls Jesus the son of David. He had time to think about who Jesus was. During all that time he had sitting, begging at the city gate, hearing the stories of Jesus, probably thinking, I wonder if this is the Messiah of God. I wonder if this is the son of David. And he realized that it was. And he realized his own darkness and his own need for Jesus. And it was this that made him passionate and persistent. So Bartimaeus rejected the crowd's rebukes. He kept shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he knew his situation was helpless and hopeless. He can't make himself see just as he can't make himself rich. He's all alone and totally dependent on others. And so he boldly and publicly stakes his dependence upon Jesus Christ alone, the son of David the Messiah of God, and over and over he says, have mercy on me. Kind of like a helpless infant or a helpless toddler who just wants something over and over and over and won't move on and won't stop asking until they get that thing. You remember what Jesus had just said earlier in Mark 10? What did he say? He said, he said that those who come Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And here we have what? Blind Bartimaeus repeatedly asking for us parents out there like a child. Repeatedly asking, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. This is what Bartimaeus did. And his urgency should be a mirror to our souls as well. Bartimaeus was helpless, and so he went for it, and he cried out to Jesus. He saw that he was blind. He saw that only Jesus could make him see. And if you want to see today, if you want to see God for all of who he is, if you want to know the love of Jesus, if you want to make sense of the insaneness and craziness that goes on in our world, then cry out to him. Cry out to God. Cry out to Jesus with all that you are. Admit your blindness. Confess your rebellion and your sin. Admit that you have a God of your own creation. Because we all do. And whatever false gods we have, do whatever we want, and we don't have to obey. But you know it doesn't work. 
because we need a God that's outside of our own making. We need a God who is sovereign and holy and above all things. And so we call out to him, God, have mercy on me. And when we cry out to Jesus, we know that he will answer. And when he answers, our world changes, just as it did for Bartimaeus. So we see the desperate situation. Now we see the desperate faith that saves. Before we continue, we have to remember that Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, he's going to die on the cross. And he's determined, remember what we saw last couple weeks, he's determined to fulfill this destiny. He's leading the way. His mind, though, must have been racing. His heart must have been starting to fill up with the sorrow for the cross that was waiting for him. It would be understandable if Jesus just kept on walking, wouldn't it? We would understand that Jesus just had to get to Jerusalem to die on the cross. But when this poor man called him, he stopped. Isn't that amazing? I mean, Jesus had more important things on his mind. He's about to give his life for the sins of the world, but he stopped. And the caravan of pilgrims and disciples, they halted as well so that Jesus could minister to this one man. And Jesus was teaching his disciples and he's teaching us the beauty of stopping. Look at verse 49. And Jesus stopped. What a beautiful glimpse into the heart of Christ, right? What's more beautiful is that today, Jesus is doing this same thing, but on an even larger scale. Like, think of Jesus right now. He's in heaven, constantly hearing praises from the heavenly host, from the church, from his saints, and yet he's attentive to all of our cries, not just one blind beggar, but millions of spiritually blind beggars who are crying out to him all at once. But the heart's cry of one in need is sweeter to Jesus than the shallow, uninformed hosannas of the world and the crowd. So are you hurting? Do you feel helpless? If you do, then you can call to the one who stopped to hear your request. And it'll be sweet to his ears. Look at verse 49. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. So Jesus hears the cry of blind Bartimaeus. And with compassion, he tells the crowd, mind you, the crowd who had been rebuking Bartimaeus for calling out to Jesus to go call Bartimaeus. (laughs) Imagine that interaction, right? Jesus is like, hey, you guys that have been rebuking him, go get him. Like, stop rebuking him. Come, Just come get him. Jesus listened to his cry, and he's going to meet his greatest need. Can Can you imagine what Bartimaeus felt in this moment? Jesus was calling. This was his shot. This was his chance. He couldn't say no. So he throws off his cloak. He leaps up and came to Jesus. He leapt like a frog and blindly pushed his way through the crowd until he came to Jesus. And here he is, face to face with Jesus. The one who who has the most penetrating eyes is looking at a man who can't see his face. What happens next? Look at verse 51. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. For those of us that were here last week, this is the same question that Jesus asked James and John in Mark 10, 36. What do you want me to do for you? Do you remember what they wanted? They wanted the best seats in the kingdom. Bartimaeus is a radical and stark contrast that has a far more humble request. James and John wanted extraordinary glory. Bartimaeus just wants ordinary health. And I wonder if Jesus 
looked at James and John as he said that question. I wonder, because he didn't have to look at Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus couldn't see him. But I wonder if he looked at them as he said this question to Bartimaeus. But in response, Bartimaeus just says, I want to see. I want to see. Bartimaeus told Jesus his desire, his humble desire, and Jesus would use it to strengthen the faith of Bartimaeus. Jesus heard his cry just like he hears ours. Isn't that encouraging? Jesus listened to this request just like he listens to our request. And Jesus will respond to him with salvation as his answer. Look at verse 52. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Man, think of how wonderful it must have been for Bartimaeus to look and see the face of Jesus. Think of how amazing that would be. He'd be able to see the faces of all the people that were around him. He'd be able to see the, the example of, of rebuking and the anger that people felt toward him. But that first face that he saw was not the angry faces. The first face he saw was the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just picture the love that he must have had for Bartimaeus, the son of David, the gracious Messiah who stopped to give him mercy. You see, physical sight is a wonderful gift, and this miracle is hard to describe because a lot of us, we, we all just see. Like, we don't, we don't, you know, have a time where we haven't been able to see. But think of what it was like for Bartimaeus. He was blind at the start of Christ's sentence. At the end of this sentence, he's able to see. No surgery, no doctors, no offense, Bill. No surgeries, no doctor, no wait time, no bandages, just sight. Isn't that amazing? It's unbelievable. He saw human beings for the first time. He saw the crowd that had been preventing him from coming to Jesus. He saw Jericho, known as the City of Roses, filled with palm trees, and saw the mountains in the distance for the first time, the, the sun in its glory, and then his gaze came back to Jesus, who healed him with merely a sentence. Bartimaeus has come face to face with his creator. He cried out for mercy, and this is the wonderful answer. Here's the answer. Jesus said, your faith has made you well. Jesus points to the faith of Bartimaeus, but doesn't say that he earned anything. It's by God's grace and mercy that Jesus extends healing to Bartimaeus. But it's faith. Faith is the, like the human hand that reaches out and receives it and takes it. I see the object of faith is what's most important here. You know, the world talks about these nonsensical statements like, just keep the faith or just have faith. It's like, well, what the heck is faith then? Faith in what? <laughs> It's just empty and silly. But Bartimaeus doesn't have that. Bartimaeus does not have an empty faith. His faith is directed to the one who could heal physically and spiritually. The word well here is also the word for save in Greek. So this both has a physical and spiritual dimension, right? Bartimaeus was physically and spiritually healed. Here's how we know this is true. Because he's able to immediately physically see, and because in response to that, Bartimaeus was not an ungrateful recipient of grace. What does verse 52 say at the end? He followed him on the way. Bartimaeus becomes a disciple. He follows Jesus. He follows Christ. He's going to go where Jesus goes. He's going to do what Jesus says. Scholars say that Mark includes Bartimaeus' name because he's a leader in the Jerusalem church because he followed Jesus. He followed Jesus where? To Jerusalem. Where there would be the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. There would be the horror 
of the crucifixion and then the joy of the resurrection. All of that happened within the first week of being able to see. Imagine you're blind, and the first week of sight, you're seeing the events of the passion, right? Unbelievable, right? So what do we take from this interaction? What do we take away from it? Well, Bartimaeus is a picture of true discipleship unlike the other disciples. Bartimaeus is humble. He saw his inability that he was totally dependent upon Jesus like a child, and he comes to him with faith in his power as the Messiah. And we all are like Bartimaeus. We were all blind until Jesus gave us sight. We were all poor beggars until Jesus saved us as our ransom. Remember what that word means? Ransom. We brought nothing to Jesus but our weakness and need, and God graciously gave us his power and blessing. You have your Bibles open to 2 Corinthians chapter 4? Let's turn back there. I want you to see this. So 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4 talked about the blindness within the human heart. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, describes a transformation says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness. So the creator God, right, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So God Almighty has to come and help us to see. Amen? And if you have not yet experienced this, then you need to cry out to Jesus. You need to cry out to him. Say, Son of David, have mercy on me. Ask Jesus to take away your darkness, to take away your sin, and to give you new life. And he will. So Jesus was passing through Jericho. He would never come that way again. And if Bartimaeus didn't respond, then he would have missed his chance. But praise God that Jesus has stopped and had time for Bartimaeus. And praise God that Jesus stopped and had time for you and for me. And Jesus is passing by us today. And if you haven't yet trusted in Christ, today's the day to do it. There is hope for anyone who looks to Jesus with faith and he'll transform your life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you that you give spiritual sight to those of us who are blind, that you help spiritual beggars. You give us everything we need spiritually. You give us your righteousness so that though we are we are worthy of, of death and judgment and hell, Lord, you, in your grace, give us your perfection and your sinlessness and your holiness so that we would be made right with God. Thank you, Jesus, for your transforming power. Thank you, Jesus, for the ongoing presence of your Holy Spirit that encourages us and draws us closer to you. We ask that you'd be glorified in our heart, in our lives, and that you would help us to continue to be strengthened as we seek to live lives that honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you all would please uh, rise for our closing song before we have communion. Amazing grace, how sweet.
Amen. You can be seated. Well, it's a great joy to come together at the communion table together. For those of you that have professed and believed in Christ Jesus, we invite you to actively participate through the eating of bread and drinking of the juice together. Uh, If it's your first time here, or it's been a little while, maybe you missed last month, we are back to passing out the elements, so we'll be doing that momentarily. If you're not yet saved, take this time to pray, to think about what we just heard, that this is a time where Christ is making it clear, there's an opportunity to profess Repent and believe in Christ and be saved. So this is a great time to wrestle and pray about that. That's not a bad use of time. So with that said, we're going to continue back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 22. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and we had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Pete, would you pray for us? God, we praise you for your obedience to the cross, that you led the way to Jerusalem where you knew we would die for our sins. God, we praise you. And we thank you that your body was broken in our place for our sins so that we might have life. Let us be encouraged with these words. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the body that was broken for us. Let's eat together. Continuing in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you pray for us again, Pete? And Lord, we do proclaim your death and your resurrection, Lord. We thank you and praise you that your blood was shed for us, that you atoned for our sin, and that though our, our sin makes us 
red like crimson, that your, your blood has washed us white as snow. We thank you and praise you for the forgiveness that we can walk in, the newness of life that we can experience, and the joy that we can have in a relationship with you. So Jesus, give us this joy as we remember your sacrifice for us. Amen. drink together. And now we'll close our time in communion by singing, He is Lord. And let's close in prayer. Christ Jesus, you are Lord. You are victorious. You are gracious. Lord, you see even the most helpless, sin-ridden people like us. Lord, I pray and ask that all of us who have received sight from you, Christ, will respond with faith in following you 
and being that model of disciple for many to see and many to hear about. Lord, that we can be a witness in word and deed of who you are, Christ, and all that you've done and all that you're continuing to do. God, pray for those here this morning that do not yet know you, Lord, that they will consider and ponder, like what we heard, Lord, of just the reality of pride and sin that gets in the way that is the ultimate stumbling block to repentance and salvation and faith in Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for this time together. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So again, we invite you to stick around. We've got some refreshments in the cafe, and we're going to be hearing more from the Clemmers soon. So stick around in another five, ten minutes. Go in peace. <laughs>